Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 28th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quick follow up to yesterday's Apple patches. We do have more details regarding uh, one more of the patched vulnerabilities, CVE 2022-22583. This allows bypassing of uh, the system integrity protection mechanism when macOS installs uh, files, it first extracts them in a temporary directory and NetHacker in this case could swap out that temporary directory that was created using digitally signed and trusted files with unsigned files and as a result then essentially bypass the system integrity protection process. So typical case of insecure uh, temporary directories. Now the file name here is random, but the attacker's script would be able to gather what the file name is and with that it be able to impersonate the trusted files. I also put together a little uh, table sort of summarizing uh, the vulnerabilities. Let me know if you like me to do this in the future again with Apple Patch, a little bit like what we're doing with uh, Microsoft Patches. Doesn't look quite as nice yet. I have to fix the design a little bit, uh, but wondering if this type of content is useful to people. And well, if you're running Mac OS, uh, one little security add-on that's quite popular, and I've been using it as well, is the little snitch firewall. Now, one of the features why people like uh, this firewall is that it's able to alert you on outbound connections. So if you have some software trying to either exfiltrate data for command control channel or just uh, connecting, for example, for advertisement or user tracking purposes, well, uh, you may intercept that connection but there's an interesting vulnerability in little snitch that sadly cannot be patched the problem here is that little snitch does only inspect the connection once payload is being transmitted so in a tcp connection the initial handshake which typically does not contain payload will still be performed this of course does allow for a data exfiltration because even if if there is no payload with, for example, port numbers, TCP options, or any number of fields in the TCP header, you will be able to exfiltrate some limited information. And of course, since you're getting the SYNAC back, you'll also be able to receive information. Now, the blog post by Ryan Gesterkorn, who uh, found and reported this vulnerability, states that, yes, they reported Little Snitch. Little Snitch did not uh, fix the vulnerability uh, because they would like to block not just IP addresses, but also host names. And that's sort of uh, where uh, the payload comes into play. The blog post doesn't really explain in detail, but what I think is happening here is these days you have a lot lot of uh, TLS web servers, for example, behind proxies uh, like uh, Cloudflare and the like. So you want to block them by host name. You could block the IP address after you see a DNS resolution, but uh, there may be multiple different hosts that use the same IP address. So what they're likely doing is they're looking at the client hello, the first payload packet being sent by the client in order to decide what host name you are connecting to. And of course, that only happens if they do allow the three-way handshake. Exploitation of this, of course, is not quite straightforward and the uh, possibilities are a little bit limited, which may also be why a little snitch uh, did not really assign this a uh, very high priority. But then you may say, hey, it's not really necessary to block these connections because there is no malware for a Max. Well, ESET Security published an interesting blog post about Dazzle Spy, a waterhole attack that is targeting entities in Asia with a Mac OS malware. This malware did take advantage of a WebKit exploit, so yet another reason why you do want to keep your systems updated. 
So, well, uh, you may say, hey, I'm not going to click on any malware and uh, that uh, watering hole malware isn't going to be a problem for me to talk about exactly the problem of people clicking on things I have with me today. One of our sans.edu students, Jeff, who did a research paper on how to best conduct anti-phishing training. So, uh, Jeff, uh, why don't you just introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you very much, Johannes. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Jeff Parker, and I'm in the health insurance industry. I've been in cybersecurity awareness and education for, I think, about a dozen years now at this point. And my role is largely, when I come to an organization, building a security awareness program. And a lot of that involves uh, what we do with phishing simulations. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. So context for today is largely education and awareness, but specifically phishing. Yeah, so phishing tests and such, they actually, last couple of years, have gotten a little bit controversial all for a sudden, uh, where uh, people you know, don't necessarily like those phishing tests anymore. Some of it may be legitimate, but they're not really that useful. Some of it may be just people being embarrassed by them. Just in general, but without going into too much depth of your paper yet, what do you think are sort of some of the key points to keep in mind so for a successful uh, phishing campaign? Well, one of the things I think that's so important about phishing simulations or the phishing tests are that we find out as an organization what our current level of risk would be or may be if we go through a real phishing attack. So there's the element of risk. There's another element involved in phishing simulations, which I think is at least as important, which is giving users scope for training and education. Training meaning what to do if they suspect they actually have received a phishing email and education about what are the different methods the bad guys are using, how to spot them, um, sort of the learning behind all that training. And so that's really where I focus a lot of what I work on. And I, in, in many cases, if you're in given types of organizations, there are audit requirements that mean you must conduct phishing assessments. It's just the way things are right now. Um, but this goes way beyond the auditing. This is, this is really about what can we do to help keep the organization safe. So compliance is always a good motivation to uh, do something. But uh, you actually want whatever you're doing and whatever you're spending those compliance dollars on to be something useful uh, that actually uh, works. Years ago, when I talked to Lance Spitzner, I think it was about some of these phishing tests and such, an interesting comment that he made uh, that surprised me at the time uh, was that part of the goal of these uh, phishing tests is also to increase the reporting of phishing emails. Kind of the assumption is that someone will always click on it that you're not going to prevent that with phishing tests. But uh, the more of the phishing attempts are being reported, the more likely you're then going to be able to go back and see who clicked on it. Is this uh, something that matches your experience? Yes, absolutely. Largely because, I mean, we, we just had this happen yesterday where uh, we had users receive emails that absolutely looked 100% legitimate from people they already were working with. So they were legitimate senders. But there was something off about the messages and there was a link they were supposed to click and then they had to input credentials. Credentials. Well, that was a case where it was actually spoofed. There was a malicious payload. The links were malicious. Um, it was bad. And our users, because they've had education and training, reached out, reported the phishing right away. Our cyber threat management team could start dealing with it. And better yet, they went a step further, some of them, and independently contacted the sender to verify it. Sender could not verify it. They didn't click on any links or anything. That's really when I start thinking about what the phishing simulations are about, why the reporting is so important. Those are the two reasons right there. That's kind of the maze at the heart of the castle. Now, you just mentioned sort of one of these very sophisticated phishing attempts. So it's not your Nigerian prince necessarily <laughs> that uh, most people are able to identify uh, these days, but uh, something uh, rather targeted. And I think that's sort of what your paper is also getting at, that uh, within the organization, you have a wide range of users. Uh, you also have a wide range of phishing emails that are coming in, and uh, you're trying to tailor that best. Uh, can you introduce a little bit? Uh, what your paper was sort of about and uh, how you sort of arrived at a more meaningful phishing si simulation there? Yes, uh, happy to. Really what this is about for me 
is, and really what the paper was about, was creating a new model. And when I say creating a new model, fishing simulations until basically what I wrote this paper about and what our research was about haven't really changed for like a dozen years now, 10, 12 years. They started off where you literally uh, create phishing messages, create subjects, create levels of difficulty for them, and then send them at random to fixed groups in the organization, like different areas, maybe HR or finance or customer service, it's a sales, et cetera. The model that I looked at said, okay, let's not use those containers of users or those groups based on where they work. Let's use those containers based on the level of proficiency they have. What is their click rate? What is their reporting score? Something we call their fish prone percentage. And based on that, we send them messages that match the level of skill they have. And what I think changes there dramatically, and the, the statistics showed in the paper, is that the level of proficiency continues to climb. And by doing that, it's kind of like uh, progressive learning or progressive training. And it definitely, definitely made a difference. It, it lowered our risk levels and, and improved our models. I think that the auditing is important and, and compliance is important. But more importantly, the bad guys are going after our users. Our users need the right tools to be able to defend the organization. So essentially, it's a more intelligent phishing test yes. where a user receives a phishing email that teaches them something new based on their skill level, based on the demonstrability to recognize phishing emails in the past. Yes, I call it a tiered dynamic phishing system. It's tiered because it's based on levels or tiers, groups formed by percentages of fish burn. Like we have our zero percenters who have never been caught, our one to 10 percenters who are very good, but they may have clicked once or twice in the last year. Um, and we use those to give them progressively harder or match the levels of, of messages that they can handle. Um, and that's that's really where it comes in. And, and something really interesting happened, separate and aside from all the metrics, was that when we implemented this system, we started to get positive feedback from the users. It's like, wow, that was a really good phishing test. Boy, that, that one really got me. Or, you know, these are so appropriate or these are so realistic to what we're actually seeing come in from the outside. So that hadn't happened before. Usually we were getting a lot of whinging and, and people upset because they had to take the phishing assessment. But this really changed dramatically. Like another criticism that often comes back is, of course, the naming and shaming part kind of of this. And uh, I think, you know, people agree at this point that a phishing test shouldn't be about pointing out how dumb users are, but to teach them something new, uh, to be educational and sort of to skip that naming and shaming part. Do users, in your case, know in what tier they are? Is this sort of something that uh, you advertise or is this uh, something that you don't necessarily tell users that they're considered a uh, more sophisticated user versus someone else? No, actually, they don't know that there's a tiered phishing system in play. All they know is that there's uh, messages they're getting and did they pass or did they not pass? Um, and then requirements we have if they if they click too many times in a period, they'll have to take specific training kind of thing. We don't play the name and shame game. We do reporting based on where they work, what's their area, what's their timeline look like. Uh, do we see somebody staying the same and improving? Or do we see somebody dropping down in levels? Uh, that tells us something's not okay there. And we need to focus more uh, training or development in a certain area. So for us, it's not about name and shame at all. For us, it's about do we get accurate metrics so we can look at where we need to focus more on developing those user skills? Well, it uh, sounds great. A link uh, to the paper uh, will be in the show notes. So if anybody's interested in looking at all the nitty gritty details and how Jeff made that work, uh, anything else up? Uh, you're still working on this or uh, anything else that uh, you're working on these days? Uh, working on a lot of things <laughs> all the time. But one of the things that's really cool is we get such good, sophisticated, and granular metrics out of this that we're able to start using them as input for what I call user behavior analytics um, and for risk scoring. And there's a real 
request for that from our organization because they really want to know where are we vis-a-vis the bigger organization? What's our level of ability and skill? What's our level of risk? Um, And user behavior analytics really um, helps to develop that in the sense that phishing training and the scores based from that phishing like video training or security awareness training and other types of things are all input for behaviors the users are using and possibilities for what they could or couldn't do that kind of forms that that matrix for risky behaviors or non-risky behaviors and then the score so we're tying it into that Um, it's in production for us at this point so it's the system we use and we're going to keep on using because we really like the results we get Um, i think it would be something that lots of organizations could use to their benefit obviously i'm biased because i've been working on it for a long time (laughs) well it sounds like we need to make you write another paper about that (laughs) Thanks for joining me here, Jeff. Thanks uh, to everybody uh, listening and uh, talk to you again on Monday.